looks like we're live. We are live. Good evening, everybody. This is uh, Rob Orson with the Emerging Revolutionary War. Um, I am here with some esteemed uh, historians and, and Mark Malloy. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, got, we got Billy Griffith, uh, licensed battlefield guy at Gettysburg and author of uh, a book that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, the esteemed Mark Malloy here from uh, many things, Trenton and Princeton, and today, Charleston, South Carolina, and then Phil Greenwald coming to us uh, from sunny Southside, Florida. Um, and I want to wish everyone a happy Carolina Day today, June 28th. Um, it's the anniversary of the defense of Charleston, South Carolina, the first defense of Charleston, South Carolina. And our topic tonight is kind of a random topic that we kind of came up with just sitting around smoking some cigars and drinking some beer, uh, epic moments in the American Revolution. Um, some of our favorite moments of the war that we think are pretty notable and worth discussing and kind of give uh, the, the heroes of the time um, a moment to shine. So since it is Carolina Day, we're gonna toss it down to Mark with the beautiful backdrop there of the Charleston Harbor. So Mark, give us one of your epic moments of the American Revolution. Yeah, so uh, when we were talking about this, you're trying to think of, you know, moments that, you know, were just epic. I mean, they, they you know, defied reason and logic and, you know, were written down as just amazing moments that people witnessed and were uh, passed down and became legends. Um, and one of them, one of the first ones I thought of was actually an event that occurred on this very day back in 1776. Um, you know, 1776 is most famous for all the, the northern campaigns that were going on that year. There's a lot of focus on that, but a lot of people forget that there was a British attempt to come down and capture the city of Charleston, South Carolina. Um, a large British fleet arrived off the coast uh, in June of 1776. The Americans were really kind of ill-prepared. They had a half-finished Palmetto log fort. Um, and flying above that fort was the banner you see right behind me. You also see it there on Rob's hat. Uh, it was a blue banner uh, with a crescent moon. Crescent moon was a uh, heraldic symbol uh, from uh, Europe uh, denoting the second sons. You remember most of the colonists at this time were uh, second born sons uh, who hadn't inherited the wealth of their fathers. So they came to America to make their way and they took this, uh, this heraldry symbol and put it on their banner uh, in defiance of the British who were coming at them. Um, now, the battle goes rages all day, June 28, 1776, and the British fleet is just bombarding uh, this small palmetto log fort with uh, just a few hundred uh, Carolina troops inside of it, of the 2nd South Carolina Regiment. And they're bombarding it, and there's so much firepower hitting it. Some of the soldiers say that it felt like uh, you know, the, the whole walls were shaking with the, every time the British warships opened a broadside on them. Uh, but the fort held, uh, mostly because the palmetto trees were, had this, were soft and spongy, and they absorbed the blow, um, and, uh, but they didn't break or give. Um, and some of the cannonballs actually hit them and then fell right down. Um, and uh, some intrepid Americans were able to pick these up, bring them back into their fort, and then fire them back at the British. Uh, and so the back and forth goes on all day, but one of the most epic moments uh, of the battle was when the flag that was flying over the fort, a cannonball comes, a British cannonball just knocks the, the flagstaff down, the flag drops to the ground. Uh, Colonel Moultrie, uh, William Moultrie, who was in charge of the fort, uh, was watching this happen, and uh, one of the sergeants of the 2nd South Carolina uh, Regiment, uh, Sergeant William Jasper, sees the flag goes down, and he yells at, Wash or at uh, Moultrie, he says, please don't let us fight without a flag. Uh, and Moultrie says, the staff is broken. What are you to do? And uh, Jasper jumps up on top of the parapet, runs down, grabs the flag. Uh, and as you can see in the image behind me in this painting, uh, he ties it uh, to a, uh, a sponge staff uh, that was used to fire the cannons, one of the implements. Uh, and as cannonballs are whizzing by his head, uh, he ties this off and he returns the flag to its rightful place among the, the cheers of his men. Um, and uh, the Americans will ultimately be victorious and defeat the British fleet, and they saved uh, the city of Charleston from uh, the British rule for at least four years. Uh, and Jasper himself was honored uh, uh, by William Moultrie for his bravery in battle. Uh, he's given a sword. Um, and later, uh, at the Siege of Savannah, a few years later, Moultrie is going to, or uh, Jasper's going to actually carry the second South Carolina colors at the uh, charge against the British entrenchments there 
uh, and carrying the flag, he's going to be killed uh, carrying the flag in that moment as well. So doing the same heroic deed, but ultimately paid with his life. Um, and today, uh, Jasper is honored with a statue right there in uh, White Point Gardens in downtown Charleston. Uh, he also has a statue near where he fell in Savannah as well, um, as well as having counties named after him and everything else. But it was for this, this epic moment that happened today. So quick question for you, though. What did the British learn from that? So we know several years later, the British re you know, came back to Charleston. So what's the difference between the assault in 77 and the assault in 80? Well, in 80, the, uh, you know, is Sir Henry Clinton, who was, who was uh, part of that expedition. He remembers that correctly. Uh, and they're going to actually avoid these forts uh, in the harbor. And they're actually going to go overland uh, and eventually cut off the American army that was in the city off at the peninsula and then also you know they're going to get um they're going to actually sail quickly past these forts rather than try and engage them in any sort of uh cannonade um so ultimately uh, the british are going to be successful in getting past this american defense but symbolically this was a huge deal for the american uh, uh cause because it was just a week after this victory that they're gonna the uh, declaration of independence is going to be voted on uh, and it's remembered today in the modern South Carolina state flag. You'll see the palmetto tree and the crescent moon. That's derived direct, directly from uh, this battle. Um, and if you look at the state seal of South Carolina, you will see a palmetto tree growing out of a fallen oak tree. Fallen oak tree, of course, represents the uh, British Navy. Uh, that was The ships were made of oak. Um, so it's kind of cool symbolism there. That is pretty cool. So we have another anniversary today, uh, the Battle of Monmouth, New Jersey. Uh, my friend uh, Billy Griffith over here, the man from the evil empire, the New York Yankees, who are taking on my nationals and opening day this year. Scherzer. That's right. That's right. Cole versus Scherzer, good versus evil. Um, <laughs> so, Billy, tell us a little bit about um, what one of the more epic moments that you think cam comes out of the Battle of Monmouth. Yeah, well, for me, for an epic moment, I think it's just something that really is like movie worthy, something you could literally envision being on the big screen and feeling something watching it. And at Monmouth Courthouse, a battle was raging during the early morning and into the early afternoon of June 28, 1778. The Continental Army has been pursuing the British Army under uh, the command of Sir Henry Clinton across New Jersey on their way to New York City. And they finally caught up with them. Charles Lee, the uh, senior officer in George Washington's Continental Army is going to be leading a vanguard of about 4,000 or four to 5,000 Americans. And it's his objective to catch up with Henry Clinton's army at Monmouth and attack them before they can get away and allow for uh, to pin them into place until the rest of the Continental Army can come up with Washington. Well, Lee runs into the rear guard of Clinton's army during the morning of June 28th, and he sets up his battle line. He gets into position to engage them, but then things start to fall apart. Uh, one American brigade commander, Charles Scott, for some reason decides it's time to pull his entire force out of position and when he does so it's going to perpetuate an entire retreat so washington in that morning is uh riding back several miles uh down the road from monmouth uh anticipating that by the time he catches up to lee's men they should have the british pinned in place and he'll de uh, deliver that crushing blow to potentially gain a decisive victory well as he begins arriving close to the battlefield he starts to see straggling men and columns of troops retreating away from the british so Washington is now concerned, a little anxious. He's going to ride forward and he runs into some men, including a fifer who will tell him that the Continental Army is in retreat. They are not in fact attacking the British. Furious now, believing that Lee has entirely disobeyed his orders, Washington continues on and will meet up with the general on a piece of high ground next to the English town Freehold Road. And he's gonna arrive there. And I'm gonna now read to you what Charles Lee uh, describes this encounter with Washington as being. Uh, during his court martial following the Battle of Monmouth. Now, contemporaries would record several decades later uh, that really Americans have accepted this myth that Washington was furious. He was cursing uh, until the leaves shook on trees, said General Charles Scott, uh, and he even called uh, Charles Lee a damn poltroon. Those were the words of the Marquis de Lafayette. Keep in mind, both of those men were not present on the field uh, at the immediate site where this encounter was taking place. But Lee is going to say, quote, when I arrived first in Washington's presence, conscious of having done nothing that could draw on the least censor, but rather flattering myself with his congratulation and applause, I confess I was disconcerted, astonished, and confounded by the words and manner in which His Excellency accosted me. 
The terms, I think, were these, quote, I desire to know, sir, what is the reason whence arises this disorder and confusion, end quote. The manner in which he expressed them was much stronger and more severe than the expressions themselves. When I recovered myself sufficiently, I answered that I saw or knew of no confusion, but what naturally arose from disobedience of orders, contradictory intelligence, and the impertinence and presumption of individuals, he's referring to Charles Scott here, who were vested with no authority, intruding themselves in matters above them and out of their sphere. That the retreat was contrary to my intentions, contrary to my orders, and contrary to my wishes. To which he replied, quote, all may be very true, sir, but you ought not to have undertaken it unless you intended to go through with it. And Lee's, uh, one of his staff officers, Captain John Mercer, then would say that Washington simply rode off and uh, assumed command of the troops on the field and began rallying Anthony Wayne's command uh, to try to launch a delaying action to buy Washington time for the bulk of the army to form up a defensive line on Perrin Ridge. Uh, another myth is that at that moment, Lee is now sent to the rear. He won't command troops in the field again. Not true, because Washington will turn around, come back to Lee, and will ask him if he wants to take command of the delaying action or command the troops in the rear on Perrin Ridge. Uh, Lee will say, I will stay on this side of uh, Spotswood Middlebrook. You can go back to Perrin Ridge, and I will make sure that I'm the last man uh, to leave this part of the battlefield. And Lee will stay true to his word. He's going to form up a delaying action. Uh, minor defense will take place against the onrushing British troops that buys Washington time to form up those main defenses on that high ground of Perrin Ridge. Uh, after that, Lee is then asked to return to English Town about four miles or so away to reorganize his vanguard troops. So he will be off the battlefield by that point. So a lot of these myths go into this epic moment. As you can see, what Lee clearly said, um, it wasn't what Washington said, so there was no cursing until the leaves shook on trees. It was more just how he expressed himself. He was angry, okay? Things were not at all going according to plan. He arrived on the field believing that he was going to be fighting a decisive battle that day, and instead his army is on the brink of being routed. Now, one more epic exchange that happened not too long after that encounter. I think it's funny, really, more than epic. Uh, but while Lee is forming up his defensive line at what's known as the Hedrow, uh, one of Washington's staffers, young Alexander Hamilton, will be on the field. And uh, his juices are going to be flowing right now because he's going to um, be uh, described as being flustered and in a sort of frenzy of valor. He's going to raise his saber and shout to General Lee, that's right, my dear General, I will stay and we will die here on this spot. And then Lee will kind of respond to him. Uh, I'm responsible for something more than my own person. Uh, give me a chance to do what I need to do here. And then I will die with you on this spot, if you please. So I'm sure Hamilton is probably a little embarrassed after that. So, so uh, briefly, tell us what happens to Lee afterwards. Um, you know, just kind of a brief overview of, because, you know, th this is, this is the last we really see of Lee in the war. Yeah. So, um, Charles Lee was his own worst enemy. He was by far, he was one of the best generals in the American forces at the beginning of the war. Uh, he, always had a he, habit of... He was at uh, Sullivan's Island. He was technically in control. So that's kind of the connection between Battle Sullivan's yeah, Island. Yeah, he was there and then well, Clinton was there too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, after the battle, the battle goes well for the Americans. They hold the field at the end of the day. So Lee failing that morning, it really doesn't have any true uh, dire outcome on the battle itself. But Lee believes that his honor, uh, just like many men at the time, his honor has been slighted uh, by his treatment that day. He believes he needs to defend himself. And he actually gets into basically a, a war through letters with Washington in the days following the battle. And he's gonna keep running his mouth until he, def he offends Washington. And we all know how much of a, speaking of men of honor, how honorable George Washington was. So if you can actually tick Washington off, you know you did something bad. Uh, so at that point, Lee is going to put on court martial, be uh, put into a court martial, and uh, throughout July and into August, he's going to be trying to defend himself um, from some accusations, basically just being a jerk uh, and disobeying orders. Um, and he he'll be cleared on some of them, but he'll be cashiered out of the army, uh, and he won't command troops in the field again. So one of the the brightest stars you can say in the Continental Army, all uh, because he had a big ego. Uh, he's going to ruin his military career. Yeah, and, um, you know, Lee, I think, 
there's um, a lot to say about Lee, but I think one of the things that he runs into is the buzzsaw of the Washington machine. And I don't want Mark jumping from his chair down there, getting all mad, talking <laughs> bad about Washington. But if yeah, you carefully say, <laughs> yeah, but if you were on if you were on Washington's bad side, uh, you know Hamilton and Lawrence and others would go after you. Washington had a a goon squad, as I will call it, that came after people. And that way he could stay up here and, and be kind of, you know, um, not get dirty in the mud. But he had people go after him. And, and, and I'll talk about one later on. But Lee was definitely someone that uh, said the wrong thing in Washington and went ahead and had his people take care of him. So <laughs> <laughs> when you agree, Mark, would you not agree with that at least? Uh, I would say he had loyal followers. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> loyal followers. Just like, um, <laughs> you know, with another person who is obviously accused of treason, Benedict Arnold, Washington was a big supporter of Charles Lee. All right. Even during the, the dark days in 1776, during the New York campaign, he's turning to Lee mm -hmm. um, for a lot of uh, suggestions when it comes to tactics and strategy. Uh, and as Lee's captured in 1776 in Basking Ridge, New Jersey, and is finally exchanged in the spring of 1777 and, or 1778 in Washington has essentially like this big welcome back party staged for Lee when he returns. He was ecstatic to have him back in his army because he really respected uh, what he had to say. Oh, and as did, I think, a lot of the rank and file, too. Uh, uh, Charles Lee was dispatched uh, down to, as we were talking, Charleston, South Carolina in 1776. And William Moultrie, who was in command of the troops there at the time, he said just the personage of Charles Lee coming down there, he said, had the effect of a thousand troops in, in reinforcements. Uh, that was like how much uh, he meant to the people there as far as, you know, the reputation uh, that preceded him. Uh, but yeah, unfortunate for him. Uh, he didn't really do much with that. So, <laughs> and I, just, I mean, to give Charles Lee some of his credit, uh, I think Christian McBurney wrote uh, a recent publication up on the court martial. And one of the things that gets overlooked is that the year plus that he's cap or held captive, the transformation of the Continental Army and what they're able to do, and what the, uh, from when he left to when he was captured. I mean, a ragtag army going retreating hell uh, hellmell across New Jersey. To an army that is uh, coming out of Valley Forge, and so he's he's campaigning to, of caution and this and that. So he's pretty much setting up what he's something that is setting himself up for failure in, in that regard by what he's saying about what how the Americans can win the war and how they can't win the war. And now that the American army that is coming out of Valley Forge is a different beast than the American army or the part he was leading when he was captured at Basking Ridge, what a year and a half earlier. So yeah, it's, exactly. It's, and unfortunately, those words kind of come back to, to haunt them uh, at those um, missile what a uh, command council, which Washington is great about calling and then for some reason doing whatever he wants to do anyway. So, but I don't want to get on Mark's bad side about Washington. Yeah, you don't talk bad about Washington on one of these, and Mark gets a little agitated. <laughs> <laughs> Mark's already agitated. We can't agitate him anymore. <laughs> uh so, Phil, thanks for being here. Uh, Phil is our wounded warrior today down there. Mr. Greenwald has a small accident, but he's doing fine. People are actually ask, asking, Phil, how you're doing. So you have a, a legion of followers over here asking about your condition. I told some people that you're doing just fine, obviously, since you're here with us. So Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm on the right side of the right side of the earth, Phil. I'm not uh, more than an alligator. <laughs> and you uh, were sober, right? You were sober. So. Sober. And I thought I do realize today how hot it must have been a mammoth because I think we hit 108 with the heat index or so. So, um, yeah, and this was just annoying to have, like, sweat going down inside your hand. I can't imagine a wool jacket. So, um, if Washington's temper wasn't that hot, at least the temperature was. We can all agree on that. <laughs> but, so, um, share one of your moments, Phil. Um, one of the guys, so, um, taking it back really early in, in the war, and I think it doesn't get enough um, – Appreciation. I mean, they make fun of him at the crossing of the Delaware. That's Henry Knox. Um, Henry Knox, um, I think someone called it the greatest logistical operation in American history, or if not, at least one of them, is when he can bring, what, over 60 tonnage of uh, artillery from Fort Ticonderoga and starting in November of 1775 and get it into Boston, uh, what, five months, uh, a little over five months later in, in May of 1776. Um, just that whole feat. Um, I think that is that would be a 
cool do either documentary. I know there's been a few done randomly. I know there's a new book coming out on Henry Knox and that our, and the artillery stream um, that comes through New York. And there's a series of markers that, uh, that go through the state. I don't know how well they're still up, but at one time there was a trail um, that you can uh, follow as well. But just to be able to bring these guns down, which leads to um, the evacuation of Boston, because these are the guns that are put up uh, on Dorchester Heights, um, yeah. leads to what Hal's favorite uh, Hal's quote about they do more in one night than I can get my army to do in a matter of months. Um, but I mean, to realize that Henry Knox basically, uh, even before the war, uh, a bookseller, but is asking questions of the British that are in Boston and gleaning information about the military. Stocking away for uh, to be uh, for future use. Um, I think even Nathaniel Green comes in um, for books as well. But uh, and then his wife. Um, to um, I mean, we always hear once again. I feel like I keep bringing up Washington, and I'm just toying with disaster. <laughs> we really how Martha Washington uh, travels for George, but I mean, it's uh, Lucy Knox is uh, very present as well, and she has given up a lot um, as their family is uh, remain loyal to the crown uh, to go with. Uh, Henry Knox, um, and I mean, it's Henry Knox that, um, I mean, serves faithfully throughout the, the war and then becomes uh, Washington's first um, what, uh, Secretary of War. He's actually, I think, serving as Secretary of War for the uh, Confederation Congress, too. So uh, it's an amazing, uh, I mean, large in life personality, not making fun of his weight, but uh, large in life personality that uh, does something remarkable. I mean, we just, as a you know, our group, went to Fort Ticonderoga uh, this past November, and I mean, it's a hefty trip in a, in a Van, even with Rob driving, um, <laughs> and, uh, the latest safety precautions that uh, a minivan um, can have. It's it's a perilous trek then on modern roads. I imagine, I mean, he didn't lose a single artillery piece on the whole movement down, which is uh, remarkable. Um, plus, getting him away from Fort Ticonderoga too. I mean, he has to go up and deal with whoever's there. And we know Benedict Arnold and who is it? Um, Ethan Allen had a uh, disagreement at Fort Ticonderoga, so. That's one of my epic moments. Um, I'm curious about the new book that just came out. It's on that Amazon uh, wish list. But yeah, one of my large, literally larger than life epic moments is Henry Knox and the first, the greatest logistical operation, least in early American history. That's great. And speaking of new, speaking of new books, uh, I've been saying Billy has a new book coming out, Handsome Flogging, but it's actually printing right now. So. If anyone's interested in a new book about Monmouth, uh, check that out on our website or Amazon or Savvy Speedy's website. Um, looking really forward to that book. And we also feel your book is coming out as well in the near future, correct? Yes. Uh, last I heard, it was headed for uh, last macro check by the publisher and then headed to the printer um, as soon as they got few, some of the other ones in the queue. So hearing that Billy's book is printing, that means the queue is moving forward. And things are starting to uh, get back in the gear uh, post, somewhat post pandemic. Somewhat post pandemic, right? Yeah, the printers were kind of shut down there for a little bit, but uh, the Monmouth book is going to be great because anyone who's ever been to Monmouth Battlefield, it's a great park, but it's kind of hard to understand the events and the interpretation that's going on there. And Billy's book really kind of uh, tells that story and, and, and serves as a really good guide to the battlefield. And it's um, a, also a guide for not just the battle, but the entire campaign. True. Too. So start, it follows the entire Continental Army's route across New Jersey from Valley Forge towards New York City, and then as well from uh, Henry Clinton's army from Philadelphia across the state to New York City. So it's going to have uh, tour routes all along the way describing the advances of both armies. Great. Um, I'm going to share a, a really sh a short one here about epic moments. I'm going to I'm going to talk about something that isn't remembered very well in American history. And another person that suffered at the hands of Alexander Hamilton and the Washington machine, and that is Horatio Gates's flight from Camden, Camden to Hillsborough, North Carolina. Though not a great moment in history, but it is epic. The fact that um, August 16th, 1780, the American uh, army is practically swept off the field there just north of Camden, South Carolina, um, Baron de Cobb with uh, Phil's Marylanders and, and Delaware Continentals are kind of holding the line, but the militia there gives gives pretty quickly. The Virginians give pretty quickly a, a bad day for Mark and I being native Virginians, but uh, Gates gets, gets wrapped up in the big retreat, um, which is understandable considering if you've ever been down there and studied the battle, it's uh, 
you know, you can see how someone can get swept up by thousands of, of, of fleeing soldiers. But he continues on all the way to Charlotte that night, which is a good 60 miles there about from Camden. So obviously Horatio Gates wasn't in any hurry to slow anything down. He got to Charlotte, North Carolina pretty quickly. Then, of course, by the 19th of August, he's all the way in Hillsborough, North Carolina. And um, many people, such as Hamilton, I'm going to read a quote by Hamilton I pulled up here. Um, Hamilton really kind of goes after Gates. And there's a lot of history here about Horatio Gates in Washington. Um, of course, Horatio Gates is known as the uh, hero at Saratoga. Um, and depending on which scholar or which, which source you want to read, uh, Gates was gunning for Washington's command and had some political support in Congress for that. Um, Washington hadn't hadn't achieved many military victories. And of course, Gates just captured an entire British army. And you can argue that brings the French into the war. But so there's some history there between Washington and obviously Hamilton, who's a big fan of Washington. Uh, keep in mind, Hamilton was not at Camden. Um, and so but he would write a few days later. Was there ever an instance of a general running away as Gates has done from this whole army? And was there ever so precipitous a flight? 180 miles, though it's more like, uh, what do I have here? It's more like 120, but it's Hamilton. So um, he you know, exaggerates a little bit. Uh, 180 miles in three days and a half. It does admirable credit to the activity of a single man at the time of his life, but it disgraces the general and the soldier. Um, Gates does continue to serve as the commander of the Southern Army uh, for a little while longer um, up into through the winter. So um, Gates doesn't get, you know, court martialed. He, he's asking for courts of inquiry. Um, nothing really happens to him officially, but he wants uh, Nathaniel Green replaces Gates uh, in the winter. You don't really see much more of Gates. Gates and Lee are some are two figures that are kind of really parallel tracks. These former British officers, uh, they live within a uh, few miles of each, each other in Win near Winchester, Virginia, up here in the Shenandoah Valley. They become close friends, um, and they're both, uh, you know, kind of casted away by Washington. Um, so they kind of lead a, a, a double life there. I and mean, both men uh, really don't really have a uh, success story after, you know, after uh, Monmouth for Lee and, and Camden for Gates. Gates is going to get tied up in the, uh, the Newburgh affairs up there in uh, New York and New Jersey. So he's going to even further dig himself a bigger hole uh, with Washington. Um, but I think the fact that Gates gets swept off the field and, and travels, according to Hamilton, 180 miles, more 120 miles in three days is is a pretty epic moment in the American Revolution. So that's my quick, quick moment there. Not not a high moment. And Billy, I think one of the moments you wanted to share was kind of a low moment too, correct? Yeah, I guess the epic moments, they don't always have to be triumphant. Nope. Uh, but still pretty badass, or in Gates' case, not so badass. Um, but I'm going to talk about now the American assault, assault on uh, New Year's Eve, 1775, on the fortress city of Quebec up in Canada. Uh, by this time in the war, the Americans are actually on the brink of conquering Canada as a 14th colony. For some reason, we've always had an obsession, at least in that part of our history, with taking yes. Canada uh, and making it part of the United States. Um, but there are two armies moving into Canada uh, during that summer and into the winter fall. Uh, one is led by Philip Schuyler, um, as well as Brigadier General Richard Montgomery, and they're moving basically up uh, Lake George, Lake Champlain to the Richelieu River, where they're going to capture uh, St. John, Chambly, and then eventually Montreal, and another wing of this army commanded by Colonel uh, Benedict Arnold. And Arnold is going to be le leading about 1,100 men through the Maine wilderness on a 300-mile trek uh, to get to the St. Lawrence River from kind of the southeast and link up with Montgomery at Quebec, where they will take the city and take uh, Canada. Well, by the end of December, uh, both forces have moved and joined up and they're outside the fortress walls of Quebec, but they're starting to run out of food and a lot of their enlistments for their men are going to expire on January 1st. So it's time to make a move. Montgomery will be in overall command of these troops outside Quebec City and him and Arnold are going to decide to wait for a big snowstorm to cover their advance as they force the walls of the city. And, and that's going to come on the night of December 30th, come four in the morning. 
Uh, two wings of this assault are going to be moving against Quebec. Montgomery will be leading one uh, at the southern portion along the St. Lawrence. Uh, they're both aiming for the lower town outside the walls. Uh, so then Arnold's command of about 600 men who are going to be moving in from the north, they can link up in the lower town and then force their way through the gates into the upper town and take the city and its garrison. Well, things are going to start to go good. Well, at least for Arnold's command in the beginning, they're, they're actually going to force their way uh, along the northern portion of the town and, and get towards the lower town itself. But uh, almost immediately, once they start to get right outside the walls, the British are gonna open fire. They thought that they were gonna have some secrecy behind this assault. Uh, it, it's really, if, uh, the biggest comparison I can make to this attack is, is the, the climactic scene of the charging of Fort Wagner and glory. That's what I have in my mind. Same music and everything playing as <laughs> I'm envisioning this, uh, but it's gonna begin with uh, two rockets being launched into the sky through the snowstorm to signal the attack uh, now that the Canadians and, and the British inside the city know that the Americans are coming, the church bells are going to start to be ringing uh, to sound the alarm. The drummers are going to be beating cadences so the men can rush to the Palisades to defend it. Uh, Arnold, it, at the head of his column with about 30 men, is going to force the first barricade, but almost immediately he's going to be hit by a ricocheted ball that's going to enter his, uh, below uh, his knee on his left leg and lodge itself in the calf behind his ankle. It's a very painful wound. It's the same leg he'll be wounded in during the Battle of Saratoga in October, uh, two years later. Arnold, still in much pain, being carried off by two of his men, is going to be ordering his men to continue on, push forward. And almost uh, immediately after that, Captain Daniel Morgan, commanding the Virginia Rifleman, who's with Arnold's column, he's going to take command of these troops and push towards this barrier that's within the streets of the town. And he's going to scale the ladder. And as soon as he gets to the top, the British behind it are going to let off a volley of musketry. And a ball is going to pierce Morgan's hat. One's going to scrape his cheek. And then apparently his hair and his beard is just singed off because of uh, this musket fire. He falls off the ladder, but gets back on, tumbles over top of the palisade. His men follow and they actually capture uh, these British troops defending this barrier. And they're going to hold out now in this lower part of the town and wait for the rest of the main column in Montgomery's wing to meet up before they push forward. That's going to be a grave mistake because on the other side of the attack, Montgomery is forcing his way along the lower banks near the St. Lawrence River. Single file line, he's going to push through two picket posts and then he's going to see a blockhouse about 50 yards in advance of his position. He sends forward a man to see if there's anyone there. They say it's abandoned. So Montgomery is going to draw his sword and lead about a dozen men forward. They close into about 20 yards of this blockhouse and all of a sudden uh, the portholes inside of it swing open the muskets level. There's about four cannon that are going to roll forward and just the entire blockhouse is lit ablaze. Montgomery's hit by grape shot in the head and killed instantly and almost every man who goes forward with him is either killed or wounded. And that's going to be the end of his attack is now his men will fall back. Montgomery's body as well as 12 others are going to be found the next day uh, frozen on the ground, but recognizing who Montgomery is, uh, the British are gonna actually take him and bury him with full military honors. Um, but he really becomes the first, you can say martyr or well nationally known martyr of the American revolution, uh, even more so than say Joseph Warren at Bunker Hill. Uh, so now that Montgomery's attack has failed, Morgan's men are gonna realize they are surrounded as British troops have rushed out of the city and have surrounded them on all sides. So Morgan and about uh, 400 other men will surrender, including Captain John Lamb, who will eventually be, we had an article about him the other day mm -hmm. uh, that Phil wrote, will take command of the Continental Artillery later on after he's exchanged. And same with Eliezer Oswald, close friend of Arnold, will also become a colonel in the Continental Artillery as well. And with Montgomery is Aaron Burr, a young 19 year old volunteer. And supposedly he writes that he tried to drag Montgomery's body off the field before he was forced to withdraw. So a lot of well-known men uh, are with this, this epic assault on Quebec that will fail and eventually will lose that chance to take Canada for the Americans. And that, that spot where Montgomery thought, I believe it's marked today. I've never been to Quebec, but, uh, but that's why we need to go up there next year. Hey, we're, we're going, <laughs> we're doing it. We're doing it next fall. Let's do the, it. the death of Montgomery is uh, a print I used to have. It's uh, I have a smaller version, one by Trumbull that was done 19th century so um it's much overlooked but it obviously was a very important event to the people who lived then because montgomery is a big deal and obviously we try to go back and get canada again 1812 
uh, doesn't work out too well either. So um, you think they'd be a little bit wary of us right now, but um, you know, the, the death of Montgomery is a uh, one of those moments that, you know, artists later on early 19th century, late 18th century really document it really well because it was a big deal. Yeah. Just um, like the death of James Wolfe in 1759, right outside, not far away from where Montgomery is killed. Those very romantic uh, images. Right. Straight. Mark. Yeah, romanticizing things even back then, right after the war. So. Yeah. Right. You can see best. Mark, you're getting some, uh, you're getting some heat over here on the chat. We're just going to, we're going to ignore your buddy, Jeff Black for a few moments. Um, oh, no, well, I, just, so. no, I just gave him some, some cred by giving his name out. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> Somebody wants to know, Mark, who's better? Who's a better commander, Washington or Green? Oh, uh, I mean, I would say Washington. Oh well, yeah, of course, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, better. Green, Green, uh, Green kind of mirrored uh, a lot of uh, Washington's strategy as far as uh, you know maintaining this balance of the importance of the regular army and maintaining the balance of uh, ensuring you know you never your regular the army doesn't ever get in a position where it can be destroyed um, and try and have this kind of Fabian strategy, you know, attack when you can and fall back and continue to fight. But, uh, but so back to epic moments, I want to talk about this for a second. Cause I do also, I see on the chat there, you know, uh, yeah, Jeff Black's dropping quotes from the Patriot. Uh, uh, what's his, uh, 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 Billy's talking about epic moments, you know, you know, things that you could, you could make into a big screen movie. I think it's important to mention, you know, probably two of the two of the most famous Revolutionary War movies made uh, was uh, The Patriot um, uh, and uh, <laughs> The Crossing. I would say is another good one. Oh, well, that that's you would say it's the second biggest Rev War movie is The Crossing. Uh, what would you say would be? I mean, you got like John Adams, but it's not really war focused. What, what's another one? that's like war focused, other than The Patriot. I mean, you I'll got think. Morning, I'll think Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. But anyway, so those two movies, I think, uh, so you have The Crossing, which, of course, you know, I'm not going to relay those stories. I talk about those stories all the time, but 10 Crucial Days are, in my opinion, the most epic moments of the whole war. Uh, I mean, it's just epic moment after epic moment after epic moment. The Crossing, which has been immortalized in painting. Uh, you have, uh, you know, the actual battle trend. You have the Washington speech to his troops before the, uh, the Battle of Princeton. You have the Battle of Princeton where Washington rides into the center of the, the field with all the bullets flying and his death, his life hanging as it were by a thread, which we had on our post earlier this week. Uh, so all of that stuff could be made into a movie. The crossing only goes up to Trenton and it stops. I wish they would include them, would have included Princeton. Uh, but you can see the Princeton battle if you go to George Washington's Mount Vernon. Uh, they have a, a theater there that kind of shows like an interpretive movie about Washington's career as a general. And they do have a reenactment of, of Washington riding into, into the field there during that epic moment, which is pretty cool. Um, but, and then going back to the Patriot, which everybody likes to beat up on, uh, but it's actually, I think does a good job of really showing, uh, you know, just how violent and uh, uh, the, the battles could be, you know, one of the climactic scenes of the whole movie is uh, Benjamin Martin, played by Mel Gibson, doing the exact same thing I just said uh, Sergeant Jasper did, picking up a flag, carrying it to the front. You know, people say, oh, boo, that's a bunch of Hollywood uh, BS. Here we go. But Here the, we the go. fact is, is that that happened, <laughs> and Sergeant Jasper did it. Uh, and so it's kind of in that same uh, theme. And I do really like the final battle scene of the Battle of the Patriot, uh, which is a larger scale version of basically what happened at the Battle of Cowpens. Uh, and the Battle of Cowpens is another epic moment where you have a lot of these same guys we were talking about. Man, these guys were everywhere. Van Morgan leading the American troops. He had Bannister Tarleton's uh, troops coming up against him. Uh, now in the movie, they kind of, you know, like I said, it's, it's, they took a lot of liberties, uh, but they do have the, the basic idea that, you know, the first couple lines fell back and then you had the reserves of the regulars who held firm uh, and charged into the, the British and had hand-to-hand -hand combat. There's actually one moment in the actual battle of Calpens where uh, an American line officer has a spontoon, which is basically like a big spear and he is, he's charging up towards the, uh, uh, the, the British. He actually uh, sticks it in the ground and does kind of a, a pole vault uh, into, the, uh, into the British to uh, uh, recapture one of the guns they had there. Um, but yeah, so uh, Cowpens is for sure a real epic moment. And uh, like I said, I think it's kind of cool that, uh, that the Patriot 
chose that as one of their their epic moments to kind of uh, conclude that movie. So, so I like to uh, jump in a little bit on this Green and uh, Washington uh, controversy here. Um, or question. There's one of the epic moments that um, we always talk about engagements where it's on a, even fail to talk. Uh, one of the epic moments in the Southern Theater is uh, the, the race to the van. Um, and um, that ends on, Feb- on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1781. And um, we usually don't hear about retrograde movements being a um, precursor to the victory, but it is. I mean, it draws Cornwall South. Cornwall has to burn all its excess baggage, including burning what the, uh, the liquor. Um, supply, which is a detriment to the, the rank and file, especially uh, that time, 18th century, you think about uh, spirits help uh, revive you, especially in the Southern heat. But I think uh, Green takes what uh, he learns under Washington, he, uh, but he, he perfects it in, in a way. Um, before he even goes south, you know, he has maps or he has a um, topographical view of what the arena he's going to be fighting in. Uh, from the service he gave with Washington Valley Forge, he understands supplies and the rivers and how to have depots and but also I just finished a biography on um, uh, Francis Marion um, and he talked about the, the relationship Green has understanding um, some of the the militia feeling and um, Mark brought that a little bit up with Calpen but understanding the benefit of someone like Marion and in those ways um, Green um, I mean is what if Washington is unlucky then Green is um, the epitome of that in a uh, different realm. I mean, with Hopkirk Hill or with uh, even Utah Springs or um, setting the mode at Guilford Courthouse. But I feel like uh, Green uh, takes the qualities he learns on the Washington and perfects them in a larger arena um, at a more pivotal time. I mean, the Southern Theater, um, I feel like, is uh, the major break uh, of the entire uh, entire war, especially after Mama's Courthouse and so forth. So. The race to Dan, there's a great exhibit uh, in Southern Virginia that you can go see. Um, they uh, used to do the re- uh, reenactment or whatnot of it. Uh, who knows if that'll happen uh, next year, uh, but it's uh, in February. Um, great folks down there running it. But um, I feel like, I mean, what Green is able to do on a larger scale um, is a sign that Washington, I mean, has literally found his man in the Southern Theater, and he's allowed him uh, carte blanche to do whatever he wants. So, um I don't know if that makes him. I like to say, I mean, he's a, I would vote he's a better field commander than Washington. Washington. Oh, <laughs> oh, wow, the gauntlet's been tossed. Wow. Come on, where, I, I, where are the stories of Green riding into battle uh, with no fear for his life? Oh, what? we can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Green also dies in what, 1784, 1785. So yeah, uh, he doesn't last too long. But I mean, he's also one of those ones. I mean, that he, if he did, he'd be a typical, he'd be the American story. What does he rise from being a Quaker? He uh, rescinds that. He marches off the war. He's told he can't be part of the military because he walks with a limp. He rises all the way up through. Um, I mean, he gets slacked by, let's hold on to Fort Washington. He, he does Washington's favor by saying, I'll be a quartermaster, even though you don't go down into history. You never hear a quartermaster revive. Um, and he's the guy Washington wants in the Southern Theater. Washington, though, I, I will say, is the epicenter, the epitome of the revolution. He goes, the revolution goes, no question about it. Washington, though, has to deal with more of the political side of it as well. As commander in chief, Green can deal with more of the, just the military aspect. Washington would probably love to trade places with Green and just deal with the military aspects of everything and deal with being in the Southern Theater, but Washington has to deal with the bigger picture of being the one that reports to Congress of dealing with the political side of it. So hopefully that doesn't put me in too bad of graces with Mark. So I try yeah. to... I mean, but I, it, like Green doesn't have, you know, he doesn't have that epic moment. I mean, I think the closest thing he has is Guilford Courthouse, which is why I think they put his uh, statue there. Um, but, you know... Yeah, I mean, you talk about retreat from the Dan and stuff, or retreat to the Dan. I mean, yeah, like you said, I, mean, I don't know if you can make a movie out of it. I'm going off in Yorktown, so. Maybe if Green had some French support, too, if he had maybe, like, the French siege guns or the French Navy actually show up. Um, he had to clean up the mess from guys like Lincoln and Robert Howe and uh, Horatio Gates, who we mentioned earlier. Um so, I mean, yeah, he, uh, uh, he's, a, so, he's a dependable guy. I think he's uh, I think he's second to Washington. Uh, oh, look at that. I, I disagree <laughs> with that. 
Yeah. Oh, yes. You know, let's you know do what it. I'm going to say. You know oh, yeah. Say. You better not say it. Walk say it, Billy. <laughs> say it. Take that flag down. <laughs> Arnold and then Green. Ben, it's it's, great. Oh. I think Washington was the best Army commander in his position. The revolution would not have survived from beginning to end if it wasn't for him. Arnold was the best battlefield commander, tactically speaking. And the, or the revolution would not have survived in the early stages if not for him. And then Green, in the end, his contributions like Washington spans the entire course of the war uh, as another. He's a battlefield slash army commander. Uh, I think tactically speaking, he was a good commander serving in the right roles. And and let's be honest, Green, Green, hold on. Green, wear, <laughs> Green wears down Cornwallis so Washington can come in and clean it up, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, let's be honest here, Mark. And I also feel like Arnold, I feel like Arnold and Green is, is a different compared. Uh, Arnold reminds me of someone like, I uh, hate to uh, throw the Civil War in this, but like A.P. Hill. Great battlefield guy, packs with everything at a certain level. But you raise him up even farther than that, he's just not going to have the personal demeanor to we, handle that. Yeah. Well, that is that. That's Green an all time, that is an all time record. 48 minutes before Civil War was mentioned. 48 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> And it wasn't Mark that did it. The reason well, is that Green can handle both the dealing with the civilian side and the military. What else? Yeah. Arnold, uh, Arnold on the battlefield, yes, there's, he's probably right up there. I mean, he's a better battlefield inspirational leader than Green ever can be. Green just doesn't have that personification on the battlefield. But yeah. Arnold, you see it even with the British. He can't. He can't. He doesn't know how to handle the civilian side of things. Um, he, he's attack-minded bulldog. AP Hill is the same way. Once he gets up to core command, he starts to lose it. As a division commander, he's hard, just a hard hitter. His yeah. place is on the front lines, not in the rear. You know, just yeah. like just say Anthony Wayne. But yeah. I, I would say once once Arnold after Saratoga, he's kind of put out of commission. Then Green really steps in and becomes you know Washington's go-to guy. His his right-hand man, like Arnold kind of was. Arnold. Yeah. Arnold was by far. I mean, even over over the uh, the the pond in England, he was known as the best general in the American army. I was just going to see Arnold as a quartermaster general uh, taking that spot. I don't well, think the the good news is uh, the, there's no statues to Arnold, so that won't be coming down anytime soon. So Arnold's Arnold's protected. <laughs> yes, go get the boot. Go march on the boot. Um. I'm going, to, I'm going to turn this on Mark a little bit since you're picking on Mark. I'm going to make Mark do some kind of like self soul searching here. So we're talking about epic moments, right? Well, kind of. We've been going off on movies, but people say the Al Pacino movie Revolution is the worst. I agree with that. Um, not the Al Pacino out of, out of acting for four years. Anyways, so give me, Mark, an epic low moment for George Washington. What do you think was one of his low points of the war? I know this is hard. It's going to be difficult for you. I have one in mind, but. Uh, yeah, I know one is epic. Um, Go ahead. Actually. And it's uh, Kipps Bay. Um, oh. In 1776, he's trying to defend New York City. Uh, you know, after the disaster on Long Island, uh, they do the remarkable retreat across the East River, right where the Brooklyn Bridge is today. They cross the East River and they get into Manhattan. And Washington's trying to create an effective defense there. And the story is the British, you know, fleets there in the, the East River and they, they fire a cannonball, takes off one guy's head and the British land and the Americans just like, drop their guns and just start running right in front of Washington. Uh, and uh, Washington's there watching these guys like stream past him. So, you know, he takes out his pistol, actually aims it at one of the guys who's trying to retreat and he pulls it and it jams. Uh, it doesn't fire. Uh, so he throws it on the ground and he takes this, his sword and he's riding among the guys, like using the flat end of his sword, hitting them, yelling them to get back into line. How could they be retreating? Uh, and they all are storming past him. And he actually takes his hat off and throws it on the ground and says, are these the men I'm to defend America with? And it was almost this moment of like resignation too. That it looked like he was going to sit there and go ahead and let the British take him captive. Uh, and it was actually his staff officers around him who actually grabbed the, the bridle of his horse and start pulling him back saying, you have to get out of here. Uh, and they actually eventually get, get him off the field. But that was one moment where, you know, you can just imagine uh, for Washington what it would have been like uh, to, to realize that, 
you know, everything could have been lost there, even himself. Uh, and it just seemed lost for him. But uh, I would say that was probably one of the most epic low points for Washington. Right. Trying to rally. No one's listening to him. I must have been frustrating for Washington. <laughs> well, if he only had if, if he only had Alexander Hamilton with him right by his side. Right. What, what, what were you thinking is the epic? Uh, I was thinking Fort Washington. It's not very epic, but it's one of his low points sitting there watching the watching yeah. the fort fall right across the river. And there's nothing he can do about it. And he said, they said he wept. Uh, yeah. Nothing he can do. Well, he should have gotten him out of there before, Mark. And and Green would have Green would have gotten him out of there. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> hey, uh, Phil, do you have any low epic moments? Oh, Put you, epic. On, the, put you on the spot here. Um, or no? Are we all towards watching the low points, or just a general low? Just point? in general, in general, we're going to leave Washington alone. Mark's going to get upset with us, and we won't see him anymore for a few hours. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, we're spinning out of control. So, Phil, do you have any uh, epic low moments, um, or gonna... high moments too, or high moments? I don't want to just be negative here. We can be, yeah, we can be low or high. Positive, epic. Positive, right? Positive. Well, so we go uh, to go one or the other, right? Uh, positive or um, uh, so, so I mean, um, I guess a positive moment uh, for me, I guess, would be the uh, good. You put me on the spot here. Um, that ha I'm trying to figure out something that hasn't been talked about already. So um, let's uh, I'm gonna, uh, let's throw out Bunker Hill. I'm gonna throw out Bunker Hill. I'll stay in Boston. That's a high and low point. Um, I mean, you have um, I mean. Like uh, Bill or Billy was saying earlier, this one of the two most tragic early uh, martyrs of the American Revolution. There, um, it could be a severe low point because I mean Warren is one of those guys that holds so much together. Um, when everyone else is at the Continental Congress, um, he's the he is the uh, revolutionary spirit in Massachusetts. I mean he's serving in the he's got major generals commission, committee of safety, the provincial Congress. Um, he's a physician, uh, still working that way. Um, so, I mean, that hero, um, the, the unsung heroes are guys like John Stark, who will rise up again um, in the Saratoga campaign um, to hide there. Um, you kind of see the uh, uh, high point in the American defeat of um, what, uh, William Howe, um, seeing how many men he loses and kind of losing that um, the battlefield uh, prowess, that um, the bravery and so forth. But he tries to start to um, conserve forces. Um, as he goes on. I mean, yeah, he's working on that political side as well, but I mean, something changes on him on the uh, slopes of Breeze Hill, seeing the death uh, of so many redcoats around him and so forth. So Bunker Hill, I mean, we, it's one of the shrouded in myths and everything. Don't shoot till we see the whites of their eyes. and We don't even know the right hill. We memorized the wrong hill and, and all that. And the battlefield is pretty much lost today. It was the um, um, Enron's of um, Boston growing up, even though there's a great pub right down the road. Um, I don't know if that's another high point of the revolution, the Warren Tavern, but um, one of Mark's favorites. I digress. So yeah, Bunker Hill has a <laughs> bunch of it all there. I mean, with the uh, highs and lows, you look at it with uh, the death of Warren, um, but also the that Americans can stand if you have enough ammunition. That Americans can stand and defend a point and so forth. Um, so uh, Bunker Hill. Uh, well, and I, I think Bunker Hill is, yeah, definitely one of the most uh, epic uh, frontal assaults. And you see a lot of those, you know, I, I know the American Battlefield Trust has a whole thing about great charges of the Civil War. And, you know, you got Pickett's Charge and all these other, and Franklin and all sorts of these charges that occur that they, they kind of talk about. I think you could do something like that for the Rev War, too, because you got, you got Bunker Hill. Jeff Black mentioned Savannah. Savannah was a, I mean, you talk about epic assault across open ground uh, that the American and French forces just get decimated trying to capture uh and then you have uh you know one of the most epic moments too is uh the assaults on readouts nine and ten uh mm -hmm. you know it's it's all you know and got stony point where we were at earlier those battles were they, they went in with unloaded muskets uh it was just straight bayonets uh and it was hand-to-hand -hand combat uh and so i think i think that's one of the things too that separates the rev war from the civil war is the amount of times that the combat actually comes to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat uh, and, you know, it was very bloody and very personal when it got to that close. And it frequently happened during the revolution just because of how inaccurate the weapons were at the time. So. And the tactics, yeah, the, or the British of uh, using the, the cold steel. Yep. Uh, 
even if they didn't use it, just the specter of them coming with the cold steel. I and to, uh, like real quick, epic charges because uh, I don't want to be called considered a homer or whatever. But Vanessa Smiley would probably say one of the few battlefields she worked out '96, maybe one of the attacks there. Um, the second battle is the '96. So before I get dredged by Vanessa Smiley through the dirt, I wanted to. Not something. seeing her tonight, by the way. She's being kind of quiet. It's kind of one time that I throw something out there, and she's not even on. Uh, <laughs> not even. She's not even not even listening to you. I was going to throw out April nineteenth, seventeen seventy five, right? Uh, where it all started. Phil and I have a have a have a book about that. I was thinking of Concord Bridge. You know, Isaac Isaac Davis, the captain of the Axon Minutemen, there um, up on the hill, saying he's not afraid to go, and he doesn't have a man who's not afraid to go, and he's actually considered. Uh, the first American officer to die in the American Revolution. He dies right there at the North Bridge uh, in Concord. Um, kind of a momentous occasion where the Americans actually fire a volley at the British. Where Lexington is, some of the some of the militia on the green do fire back at the British, but that's mostly a one side affair. At Concord, you actually have an American line of infantry firing into in, into the British. So. Um, considered the birth, the birth, one of the birthplaces of the American Army, right there on the hill above uh, the North Bridge at Concord. So, I got one, one more real quick. Yeah. Unmili unreally battlefield related. Uh, we mentioned, we've been talking obviously positive light of Benedict Arnold tonight, but what about the negative light? I think one of the most epic moments of the war is when his treason is discovered, and just the all the events surrounding that. Andre being captured. And those documents unearthed and then Washington's reaction to it. I think still just thinking about it. It's one of the most gut wrenching, you know, moments of the whole war where you really feel for this man, how he himself is, feels betrayed. Not just that Arnold has, you know, he says Arnold has betrayed us. You know, who can we trust now? They did do a good uh, TV movie about that too. Uh, that Kelsey Grammer? Kelsey Grammer? Grammer? <laughs> Who did the outraged Washington uh, finding out about the, uh, the treason. Speaking of speaking of movies, uh, you know, Hamilton will be streaming on Disney Plus soon, so we'll lose Mark Malloy for a few <laughs> weeks. As Mark is a Alec as a Hamilton Homer over there, he loves him some Alexander <laughs> Hamilton, so he'll be uh, singing songs daily over there at his house in Alexandria. I'm sure. That's my wife. <laughs> can't can't blame Mrs. Malloy for we all. <laughs> this is for this is for her. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, so before we close out here, does anyone have any other kind of epic moments you want to share? Um, we're right about one hour, but we always go a little bit longer. I think, I think the moral of the story of this Zoom session is everything that happened in the American Revolution was epic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just to piggyback off of what Billy said before, you know, not necessarily Battlefield, but epic of which we will be celebrating, hopefully every American this weekend coming up. Uh, the 4th of July, which of course John Adams suggested it was the 2nd of July because that's the day they originally voted on it, but uh, uh, declaring American independence. We'll uh, be celebrating on July 2nd ourselves. Um, yep. the three, oh, yeah. three of the four of us here will be in Gettysburg celebrating <laughs> July 2nd. So, But uh, yeah, we will be doing, and it's amazing because you should read John Adams' quote about how you know the whole country should celebrate with fireworks and bell tolling and parades and flag waving and everything like that. And uh, it was very prescient because it was, uh, that's exactly how we celebrate it today. Uh, and a good dramatization, yeah, in the John Adams miniseries really yes. does show the debate and then how important a moment that was to actually go out on our own and strike out as an independent country, so. And, and properly depicts most deals are made at a bar somewhere yeah, nearby. City Tavern, uh, which is another great bar. I like uh, Warren Tavern. City Tavern's not original, but it's it's a uh, exact uh, reproduction built on the site. So you can, you're still on the GPS coordinates where they are drinking and hanging out. So <laughs> You're on the GPS coordinates. <laughs> That's what's important to Mark Malloy, that in Hamilton and George Washington. Yes, yeah, um, that basically sums up right there. <laughs> before, we exit, before we exit, we should give a shout out for an epic moment to the uh, man Thomas Jefferson. It's probably this time in 1776, sitting in some room in Philadelphia, hurriedly trying to create all the edits for that document that's going to be signed. So give it a little shout oh, out yeah. to Jefferson. A oh, well, a, <laughs> a, yeah, a well-known procrastinator, right? Reminds me of college. What? That's due tomorrow? Oh, oh bleep. <laughs> That's a problem. 
then you have Ben Franklin and John Adams read over it. So it's like great. You got like right. those guys. Yeah, and like, tear everything out of it that he wanted to keep in it. And then he ends up rewriting <laughs> it later in life. Um, that's a great segue if we're done talking about epic moments. Next week, we'll be back on July 5th at 7 o'clock um, talking about everything July 4th. Um, not just Independence Day, Declaration of Independence, but also uh, one of our guests would be Dr. Chris Mikowski, who has a love affair with John Adams and Thomas Jefferson's kind of relationship throughout life. And of course, they, they, both, they both die on July 4th. And um, Chris will talk about a book that he's working on with us right now about the Adams and Jefferson relationship. We also have Savannah Rose from National Park Service there in Philadelphia who will be joining us too. Uh, Savannah has been great for us because she's doing all the layout of all of our books. So um, as these books start to come out, uh, Billy's book coming out very soon uh, at the printer right now. Actually, I think it's already printed, Billy. And then July Phil's book, 10th ships. July 10th at ships. There you go. Um, and then, um, you know, Phil's book coming out soon. Savannah's been doing a lot of the layout work for us on these books. So she's been a great help to us. But she's also a great interpreter there in Philadelphia. So she'll be sharing some of her stories about uh, the July 4th holiday. Um, so if you're around July 5th, uh, the holiday is the third, I think, this year on the Friday before. But a great way to wind down the Independence Day weekend is uh, spend an hour with us, grab a drink, grab a seat listen to us sit here and uh, chit chat and debate about how George Washington was a second rate commander uh, for an hour. <laughs> so thank you for everybody who's been watching. Thank you for all the comments over here. They've been great to read. Uh, Jeff Black, thank you for only mentioning Benjamin Martin six times instead of the usual 35 um, times. And um, hopefully Vanessa will watch us at some point because Phil gave Vanessa a good shout out. So other than that, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. You guys have a good week, and we'll see everybody next week. Thank you.